Stuff. Who's that? Hello? Yes. This is Penelope. Mm-hmm. Penelope Pig Shop. Yes, it is. Yes, yes. Uh-huh. Do I got what? Uh, do I got coronavirus? No, I ain't got no coronavirus. Well, who told you that? Did the neighbors try to say I had coronavirus or something like that? I've been tested. Matter of fact, I don't I didn't even have to be tested. No, I didn't have to be tested. I go to my doctor center. They throw, they give me a bunch of tests, a bunch of things before I even get up in there. I had no, I had no coughing going on. I had nothing going on. So why are you calling my phone or blowing up my phone? You are messing up my mind right now. You are messing up my thoughts right now. I was getting my dance on, my freak, my bookie, my all of these things, and then you call me. No, I don't have. How many times I'm gonna say I don't have it? You didn't hear me when I said it the first time. Well, I got how many times? I got to say it one, two, three. I got to say it three times. Well, I don't have it. And if you keep bothering me, I'm going to have to call Urban, Urban Health or whatever that is. You know, that crazy guy that Steve Belcher pointing his fingers up and all of that. Yeah, I might have to call him because he looked like he's on fire to deal with the dialysis community. That's right. He does. And he had this fly woman, this fly woman. I like this woman. I mean, I watch her show every week. Matter of fact, it might be coming on now. No, no, I'm, I'm going to have to get Lisa Baxter. That's right. No, she got a big heart, but she got a round. She got a big round going on. I'm serious. I'm round, round. Yeah, she do. I don't got time for this. I got, matter of fact, I got to go. No, I don't want to talk no more. I'll see you at Dallas tomorrow, but y'all don't ask me no questions. I'm sick and sick. Where's Steve Belcher? Where is that Steve? Look, Lisa, look, Lisa. Look, look, bye, bye, bye. You know why? Because this is the Lisa Baxter Show. Ah, giving you the 411 in the kidney world. How you guys doing? What's going on? Oh man, oh man. Um happy, happy, uh, happy day to you today. Happy Pentecost Day. Happy Pentecost Sunday to you. Happy good weekend. I hope you had a good one. I got a fantastic show for you tonight. I hope you're being well and safe out there with all the stuff going on, all the hurt, all the hate all the danger, all the dying and the killing, please be safe. Please be careful. Let's love one another. Let's care about each other. Let's make change for the good. Okay? Wow. Oh, wow. I tell you, I'm just praying and I'm hoping and I'm believing, not just about the corona, but just everything that's happening going on. We need something good going on. We need some peace. But this show I have for you can just do that for you tonight. How about that? I have a dynamic duel tonight. This is a super duper 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 kidney couple. Just let me tell you. All right. I got Mrs. Dawn and her hubby Marcus, right? They, uh, she's a patient navigator, right? At Ridgewood Dialysis Center. She's the CEO of kidney for kidney's sake. Marcus, he's a, uh, was a dialysis tech. All right. He's a transplant dialysis warrior. You know what I mean? Oh, man. He's a youth coordinator in the whole nine yards. They got a fantabulous story and you better listen. So go get your snack, your water, whatever you got to go get and hear about this wonderful couple. I ain't mad at you. You ain't never lied. Sit down. All right. Come on, Dawn. Come on, Marcus. Come on to the Lisa Baxter show. Hey y'all, it's my turn, come on y'all, hey, how y'all doing? Hey, how y'all doing? Oh, oh, live and kicking, live and kicking. This is truly really a privilege to have you guys on the show tonight. Make some 
music back then. Is it mine or yours? I mean, I don't got nothing for real. I was jiving. <laughs> <laughs> What's up, Lisa? Hey, this, that, and the other, this, that, and the other. Having my dynamic duo couple, my blessed I couple. Like that name. I like that dynamic duo thing. I'm going to use that. I ain't mad at you. Come on <laughs> here. Come on here. We family. That's what we do, right? We share. Sharing Absolutely. is caring. That's what we do. Right? Mm. Wow. Wow. Man, you guys are so beautiful and so great. I mean, I had the privileges of coming to your events. I had the privileges of knowing both of you. And we're going to, man, we're going to ride and we're going to cruise down and break it down about, you know, what you guys do, what you were doing before. A little bit of this and that. So ride with me a little bit. That's okay. Right. That's right. What? Now, what type of work? A work, um, um, tell us what, what kind of work that you do um, at the dialysis center. You said you're a navigator, Miss mm -hmm. Dawn. What is that about? Well, basically, a patient navigator, we're kind of, we're the, the in-between person between patient and the doctor, patient and social worker, patient and tech, because mm. patients will tell us things that they won't tell um any any other staff member because we form a relationship with them. Um, wow. Our job is to encourage patients to be compliant, to encourage them to stay on the machine and get their full treatment. Um, when they don't come to dialysis, we find out the reason why. Um, we find out why they want to why they don't want to stay on the machine because what I find out is that there's always a reason. There's always a reason why patients skip treatments. There's always a reason why patients don't want to come to dialysis. There's always a reason why they want to get off the machine. Um, a lot of times staff, they don't really understand and know why, but it's my job to get to the meat of the situation and find out what the reason is and try to figure it out and help them to get the best treatment they can. My job is to make, to give them the tools to live, live longer okay. on dialysis. Mm. Wow. No, that's fantastic. And that's what you need. I mean, you know, I mean, just as a patient advocate, when I was a patient advocate and when I was um, with Rogerson as a health ambassador and now with DCI as a health ambassador, you have mm. to put everything you got into the job to, to, to help patients in any way that you can. You know what I mean? Mm. Show them that mm. you're human. Show them that you're real and that you really do care and you're listening. And mm -hmm. I see that you, I know you do that. I just know you do. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yep, that's I know you. What I do all day. And you mm -hmm. know, that that's what the patients need. Sometimes it's all they need is somebody to listen. A lot of times they don't have that support at home. You know, they don't mm -hmm. have that support. They don't have that person to listen. So when they come to dialysis, you know, I'm there and I'm there to listen. You know, and sometimes that's all I have to do is just listen. You know, and a lot of times certain things that they tell me, I have to take it to the social worker because there, there are some things that I can't handle on my own. So you it's know? a team effort. It's a team thing. So it's you working together along with the doctors and, and yeah, I guess the techs and yeah. the, the whole the boodle right. of the dialysis center right. to make so, things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because there's some information that they give me that I have to tell the doctor. There's some information right. that they give me that I have to tell the social worker, you know? Mm. Like if they tell me, you know, oh, you know, last night I couldn't sleep, I was short of breath, you know, mm. or my access was hurting, and I have to tell the doctor, I have to go to the nurse practitioner and say, listen, you know, so and so told me that there's an issue with their access, you know, because they'll tell me, but they won't tell the nurse practitioner. So imagine if I wasn't weren't there. Yes, you know, yes. Yeah. it would have been an issue, you know. Mm. So that's what yeah, I'm here for, just to make sure they're okay. Um, to advocate for themselves, to educate them. Because a lot of times um, you ask a patient if they have a fistula or a graft and they don't know which one they have. Ooh, so a lot of times that. I find myself having to educate them. Mm -hmm, yeah. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Well, that's good because you got to know, you know what you're dealing with. I always say, know about your illness. I don't care if it's a cold, a small thing to a big thing. You got to know about that illness and know how that affects your body or even how the medications affect your body. Right. Mm -hmm. wow. Well, I'm glad you're doing that job. I'm glad you're on it, you know, because patients out there need you, people out there need you. 
Yeah. Uh, Mr. Marcus. Yes, ma'am. Now, what uh, as a tech, what was what did your job entail? Uh, you know, just as a regular dialysis detection, uh, dialysis technician, just uh, counting the patient, putting them on the machine, uh, mm -hmm. taking their blood pressure and, and 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 watching them while they're on, and making sure everything is okay and everything is okay to make sure they're taking off the right amount of weight, what needs to be taken off. Sometimes you can't take everything off, so you take off a certain uh, percentage so they can be comfortable. And when they come back uh -huh. the next time, they could get the rest, the rest of it off. You know, a lot of, as I was a tech, there was a lot of patients that was non-compliant. And, you know, you know, you can't, you can't really uh, be, uh, get on their case as much because you're not a doctor, you're a technician. So uh -huh. when they were non-compliant, I would have to report that or either write that down in the notes. So when the doctor did see them or the doctor did read their records, they would know what was going on with them, what they were doing. So just basically well, you, just, just. Go okay. Ahead. Just no, I was saying you as far as you could take it, and some technicians don't do that. I mean, I knew I knew some that took extra off me, and boy, I was really in bad shape when they did that. They thought they were helping me, but I never well, put on a lot of. Yeah, it depends the uh, the protocol of the dialysis unit, and where right. I work. If the patient had too much weight on, we we were, weren't allowed to take the whole amount off. You're not well, supposed to anyway, because uh, by law, you're not supposed to by you know in, in any dialysis, you're not supposed to do that because, like you said, you feel weak when you get off, or the person, the the patient could get a, a massive heart attack from trying to pull all that off at one time. Wow, so my husband had, we had, we had to do it. Yeah, we had to do it in in portions. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Yeah. I believe that's better to do it in portions, but you don't yeah. know everything. You don't know if a new patient is looking or a new person is looking or even a caregiver. So sometimes I would have to ask the question, even though I know you know the answer or we may be, maybe right. somebody before, but you know, we get different people looking. So I, I, I thank you for even answering it and, and doing what yeah. the, doing the work that you do, doing the work that you do. Mm. Mm -hmm. How long have you did your job? And then, Dawn, how long have you did your job? Uh, I've been, I was a dialysis technician for 19 years. Woo! Yeah. Woo! -hoo. All right. Yeah, I was, uh, I've been a patient navigator for almost four years. All right. Mm -hmm. Woo! Woo! I ain't mad mm -hmm. at you. Yeah, it took a while um, after I got my transplant. It took me five years to find a job. You know, after you after you get a uh, after you you know get off from that get off dialysis and you get to transplant, it's not so easy mm -hmm. to get a job because when they look at your resume, they want to know what's yes. the big gap, like what happened between 2011, you know, and 2015, 2016, and you know, um, you have to. I tell the truth, you know. I Good. say, you know, I was. You know, I was I was ill, but I'm fully recovered and I'm ready to work. Some but, people um, respect that honesty. Yeah. They respect it, but I was still discriminated against because they didn't want to give me the job. Yeah, they, know, it can but, be that way because I I work. Yeah, I understand. I understand. I had a transplant too. The jobs mm -hmm. can do that to you and treat you different or funny or you know yeah. maybe even want to get rid of you. Mm -hmm. I hate to say, but I still yeah. have my job. Thank God, it's been 24 years, you know, before I had it, before I was on dialysis. And after I got the transplant, I still have it. Hopefully, it'll be ending soon where I got something better. But I'm glad that you you, you guys had this type of thing and did this type of thing. Um, what I wanted to ask you was, it was something that really wasn't on the paper, but what I wanted to ask you is uh, your, your, your journey. Now, I want to talk about, Dawn, your dialysis journey, then I'm going over to your husband. Tell me uh, something about your dialysis journey and your, your transplant journey, please. I started uh, dialysis in um, June of 2004, June 9th, 2004. I remember the exact day. Um, mm. It started because I was sick. I felt sick. I was at my mom's barbecue. I was feeling horrible. Um, I went to the emergency room. And uh, with a fever of 103, and they told uh -huh. me that I had pneumonia. And while I was in the uh, 
while I was in the emergency room waiting for a bed, a couple of doctors came over and they surrounded the bed and they said, uh, Miss Lowry, do you have uh, kidney issues? I said, no, you know, I'm, I'm fine. And they said, well, um, your kidneys have failed. You have to start dialysis. We have to put a catheter in your chest and put a fistula in your arm. I didn't know what a fistula was or a catheter. I didn't even know what they were talking about, but I knew that I wanted to go home, you know? Yeah. So, um, you know, I stayed in the hospital and it took a couple of people to convince me to stay. And I ended up, you know, having the surgery and, uh, I started dialysis at um, Rockwell Dialysis. Rockwell Dialysis is uh, downtown Brooklyn. They're affiliated with Brooklyn Hospital. And um, my first treatment was June 9th, 2004. And I remember when I walked in, there was a strange smell to me. And I remember looking at all the machines and, and the blood running through the machines. And I was petrified. I was, I was so scared. Um, so I, you know, I got my first treatment and I remember after the treatment, I felt very strange. My head was hurting. I felt very heavy. My mouth, I had this metallic taste in my mouth. Um, so when I got home that after that first treatment, I came in the house and I remember dropping my bag down and falling on my knees and crying like I never cried before. And the first thing I said is, I'm going to die. I said, I'm going to die. And I thought mm. it was over for me. And I thought that I was going to die. But, you know, God is an amazing God. He's carried me through so much. So um, being on dialysis was hard. Um, there were times where I did cry. There were times where I did get tired, but I kept pushing. And I had my friends who are very supportive. I had my family and I had Marcus, you know, Marcus and I became friends and it became dialysis. It was, it was just something that I knew I had to do. It was something that I accepted. And it's something that I knew I had to do to stay alive. And I did it because I knew that God gave me this life to live and I had to live it because I didn't want to die. I was young. I started dialysis at 35 years old. Mm. So there were things that I still knew that I needed to do. So I wanted to live. And, and, and that's when I learned that your mind is the most powerful tool you have into healing and moving and surviving. And I tell patients all the time, your mind is the most powerful tool you have in healing. You have your yeah. mind, keep your mind strong. You pray and pray and pray. I knew God was so tired of hearing me asking the same thing over and over again. But I keep, I, I still, I keep praying. Amen. That's me and too. That's the only way that I made it through. That's yes. That's the only way I made it through. You know, wow. and then I'm um, I switched dialysis units in um, 2011. I went to a Bronx dialysis, switched doctors with the Bronx dialysis. And um, it was a Wednesday, I remember, and I was on my way to dialysis. And I was in the shower. When I came out the shower, my phone was blinking like crazy. So uh -oh. I looked at my phone. I had a missed call from my mom, two missed calls from my mom, a missed call from my sister, and a missed call from um, a 212 number. So ah. I called my mom first and um, she started yelling at me because she wants to know where or how, where, where was I and how come I wasn't answering the phone. And I said, well, you know, I was in the shower. She said, well, Mount Sinai Hospital is calling you. Call them back. So I called Mount Sinai Hospital and they said, Miss um, Lowry, we have a kidney for you. Do you want it? I said, yeah. Yeah, I want it. So, um, you know, they told me to pack a bag. They told me, you know, where to go, what to do. So, you know, I started crying because I said, okay, everybody's at work. Marcus was at work. My mom lives in Texas. My sisters were at work. Um, wow. My best friend was at work. So, um, you know, I packed a bag. I called everybody and told them I was going to get a kidney. And um, 
I was on my way in the cab, on my way to get the kidney. You know, by the time I got there, my best friend was there. By the time it was time for me to get my transplant, my sisters were there. My best friend wow. was there. You know, so you know, um, and that Dang. was nine years ago. Wow! Wow! Yeah. Oh, that's beautiful. Well, we have the 2004 being on Dallas is in common, and I guess Mount Sinai we have in common because I got mine there too. Wow, that's beautiful. That's beautiful. You had all your support there, and even uh, your friend that became your husband. I'm just loving it. I've seen <laughs> love makes before only four times in my whole life, and this is just sweet, sweet. <laughs> 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 Lord have mercy, let me move on. I ain't mad at you. Now, <laughs> so your kidney journey, tell me a little something about your kidney journey. I was diagnosed with uh, ESRD at the age of 15. I don't know. Uh, dialysis back then in 1985 was a different ball game than what it is now. Uh, the, machines were much, the machines were much larger. The dialyzer was large. It was like a big stereo, a big two stereo systems put to get on top of each other. Ooh. And coming off that, after the treatment, oh, it was, it was horrible. The weakness and nauseous. And uh. I had to get, every now and again, I had to get uh, transfusions because we, they didn't have epogen back then. So, yeah, but when I first found out, I was I I, I when I was I was um naive. I said, eh, I'm not going on the machine. They told me I had to go on the machine, but when they first diagnosed me, I was like, eh, I'm not going on. They took me to the dialysis unit and showed me the machines. I said, you know, when you're young, you're like, eh, I'm not going on that. And finally, I did. And um, just like everyone else, I in the beginning, I was uh mad, you know, uh, angry, uh -huh. and I was young. I was 15 years old. I didn't, I didn't know what was going on, what, 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 what my life ahead of, ahead of me was gonna, going to be. I was, I thought, I, just like Dawn said, I thought I was going to die. I didn't think I had too much time to live it myself. Yes. Yeah. So, um, you know, activities like young activities. I had I couldn't go to parties. I couldn't go out and hang out as much as I wanted to because I was mostly weak most of the time. So yeah. at that time, my father, God bless his soul, he's deceased now. He decided to uh, give me a kidney. So uh, my first my first transplant was at the age of fifteen. He yeah. gave me his kidney. That kidney lasted, I say, about a year, a year and a half. Mm -hmm. Because back then they was it was still new. They didn't have the medications that they have now. Yeah. So, you know, it was kind of a Russian roulette type of thing at that time. But it gave mm -hmm. me time to get off the machine and to get my body strong again. And then I yeah. lost that kidney and I went back on the machine for six more years. And at the age of 21, I received another, another kidney. This is my second kidney now. This is like around 1991. Yeah. And um, I had that kidney for, I would say, for about three and a half years. The blood. I, I, I will admit, I didn't, I didn't take care of that kidney too well because I was still young. I was out partying. I was drinking, you know, just like every other young person did when they were young. So I, I yeah, <laughs> I didn't, I didn't take care of that kidney too well. So I lost that kidney within three and a half years and went back on the machine again for another six years. And now I'm in school for as learning as a dialysis tech while I'm on dialysis. Mm, impressive. You know, um, where I took dialysis, it was at Einstein Hospital. They had a program where the patients learn about the machine and how to, how to connect themselves to, to the machine. Yes, yes. So mm -hmm. I, was in that, I was in that program. And while I was doing that, I said, you know what? Why don't I just become a tech and help others that are in the same situation as I am? 
yeah. get back. You know? yeah. So I finished my schooling. Uh, Brooklyn Hospital hired me in 1999. I'm 29 at this time. Wow. And um, I was hired about three or four months in. I was called for another kidney. This is my third kidney. Wow, so Jesus. Got the kidney. Uh, thank God the job didn't get rid of me. They they told me that I was able to uh, go on a medical uh, disability until I, you know, until I heal up and come back. Yeah. So I was out for about, you know, five months, six months. And the doctor told me, gave me the okay to go back to work because my kidney was doing so well and my creatinine was good and everything was just fine. Marcus, sorry. And, Stop for a second, Marcus. Let me ask you know. a question. The, you had just started the job or was you with that job for a minute when you was a tech? When I was a, when I started a job, I still was on dialysis. Right. So but I was you a, a tech? What, what was your yes. position at that? Yes, I you was a tech. tech. Yes. All right. No, I'm asking you, know you that because you said that mm -hmm. they they was giving you time off. I thought if anybody would understand about dialysis and you getting a kidney would be them. So I, I yeah. wouldn't want would be in jeopardy or any issues or anything. Maybe yeah, I heard. You, yeah, you still have to make sure things are right when you tell them. When you tell them that you can't come to work, you know what I mean. So I had to tell them, yeah. And they already knew when I uh, when they hired me that I was already that I was a dialysis patient. So they didn't sure. discriminate. They didn't discriminate against me in any way. They hired oh, me. Yeah, they hired me off of my experience. So, nice. so after I got the transplant, I went back. And I was working there to about 16 to 19 years until the kidney started rejecting. And I started getting sick and I wasn't able to perform my, my job very well. I was getting dizzy on, at, the, at work, not feeling well, you know, feeling uh, lethargic. You know, yeah. and I said, you know what, let me, just, let me just stop because I said I didn't want to harm anyone while I'm, you know, putting them on a the machine because there was times I would feel so bad while yeah. I was cannulating the patient. So I said, you know what, let me just get out of this now before this gets ugly and I hurt somebody or I pass out or whatever. So the doctor gave me the okay to stop working and go out for early retirement and disability. And I've, I've been on dialysis now for what, three, three years now? No, two uh, years, two years now. Time. And, um, in the beginning, it was rough because my body was used to not being on a machine for 19 years. You know? wow. yeah. Yes. So when I got on that machine, my body took a drastic fall. I, uh, I had uh, arthritis in my back. Uh, I forgot the, what the name of it was. Um, lumbar stenosis. Lumbar stenosis. Mm, uh, very that's very, very pay, painful back pain. My mm -hmm. legs started to give out on me. I had arthritis. My knees. I have arthritis in my knees now. So I was, I was, I was going through it for a good uh, six months to a year. But we have a wonderful God, and God. We do. And yes, we do. When we pray, He might not answer you right away, but He answers you on time. Yes. And He He answered my prayers when Angela passed and I, and this one here needed my help because wow. she was not functional when Angela died. And I can believe out of nowhere, I was able to walk, move around, help her, yeah, help, her with, help her whatever she needed to, needed to be done. And that was God right there. That was God. Amen. God knew that she needed me. That's right. And right now I'm doing well on dialysis. I'm walking, moving around well. And I just thank God for live for life, for living. You know, I had 19 years off the machine. What can you ask for more than that? You know, and I can't complain. And I'm yeah, not so, gonna and I'm yeah. not gonna complain, you know. Yes, yes. You don't look like what you've been through. I'm <laughs> thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Not every person that deal with dialysis want to go into the field, and everybody that deal with dialysis sometimes might want to run away from it once they they feel free from it. So yeah. my hat off to you, my glasses, whatever else Thank I you. 
Scott. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. oh, oh. Wow, wow. Now, you started for Kidney's sake with uh, Angela, or you was a part of it. Tell us about that, because I know you're the CEO of it now oh. that she passed. I know you miss her. Um, yes, I do very, very much. Um, um, when I got my transplant, um, and I woke up, the first thing I felt was guilt because I still have friends that were on dialysis. And I, I, I told, I knew that I wanted to give back somehow, some way. And, um, I met Angela through a mutual friend on Facebook and, uh, she told me that she wanted a, a transplant patient on her board. So I said, wow. okay, I'm here. Here I am. And we became really good friends, sisters. Um, she was, became my mentor. And I started, be, I was her administrative secretary. Um, she called me her right hand. And, yes. um, we, and we had events and we... I helped her with for kidney sake. Her, myself, board, we we made we had for kidney sake. You know. Um, well talk and, about some of those events. Um, well we we've had um my favorite event, Pink and Pearls, you know, the yeah. luncheon, ladies' luncheon. Uh, it was yeah, something yeah. that I I had told Angela that I want to have a women's event just for women because I know as a woman on dialysis that you don't feel beautiful because things change. Your skin changes, your hair gets dry and, and falls out. Um, yeah, have a lot. You know, okay, yeah, you know, um, your skin is dry, you have the fistula in your arm and, and, and so you just don't feel the same way, you know? And I want to have this event where Women feel beautiful and are reminded that you're still a woman. That you, you just because you're on dialysis, that didn't change who you are. You know, right. you're still that that vivacious, beautiful woman. You might not feel that way on Monday, Wednesday, Friday, but um, Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, you're popping. You, you understand what I mean? So I wanted to have that event with the hand massages and the and the, all the pretty pink things, everything feminine to remind women that you know what, you're still beautiful. You know, and we have the man cave for the men where they do whatever they do. We're never there, so we don't know what goes on at the man cave. Um, <laughs> we have our annual Patients Awards Gala, Gala where patients receive awards for being advocates, uh, for inspiring other patients, uh, for being compliant for a long period of time. Um, we usually have it at Anton's and they get um, served and they dance and they, you know, um, they really have a good time. It's, I love to see it because I love to see the patients get all dressed up and I love to see them dancing and having a good time. And it just seems like they forget mm -hmm. about the machine. They forget about what's going on and they just have such a good time, you know? Mm. Yes. So, um, of course, we have like bowling events and, um, Blue shopping trips and um, things don't like forget that. I do a few of y'all events. Hmm? I do a few yeah, of y'all events. The movies was one. The movies, yeah. the Pink Pearl. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, you know. So, you know, now that we are, um, we can't be close oh, wow. to anybody anymore. So we're doing things right. virtually. So I just want to let everybody know that every fourth Sunday, for Kenny's sake, is going to have a praise party via Zoom. Where we're going to have a DJ play gospel music for about an hour and a half to two hours. And we could just listen to gospel music, praise God, and, and just feel it. You know, because we need that right now. You know, yes. we need some joy. Mm -hmm. We need some stomping and clapping and praying and what? You, know? you ain't never won. Hallelujah. <laughs> hey, that's right. Yes, yes. Is there a website or any place they can look to find this every fourth of Sunday? Of course. www.4kidneysake.org. The digit four. Fourkidneysake.org. You could also go to our Facebook page, Four Kidneys Sake, F O R, Four Kidneys Sake. You could also email us at info at the digit four. 
infoforkidneysake.org. Mm, I love that. That's right. Put it all the way out there. Put it all out there. That's right. <laughs> about these events and these special things because like you said they don't always feel like a woman they don't always feel like a man they don't feel special these type mm -hmm. of events not only teach and 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 help you or the caregiver or the family but uh, you have fun too you're able to laugh again live again find out yeah. you still you somebody's looking somebody care look you found the husband through all of that i ain't mad at you <laughs> that was uh Sometimes I'm still like, we married? <laughs> yes, yeah, that was crazy. I listen. I tell women all the time on the machine. Listen, you listen. Stick with it because you never know what God has planned for you. You never know. You know because when Amen. I was on dialysis, you know when I was on dialysis, I had a boyfriend. Oh, but nice. he left. Me. He left me because I was sick. Yes. You know, so when that happened, I was just like, oh God, I'm never going to find nobody. I'm never going to have anybody. I'm never going to have a relationship because who's going to understand? Who's going to understand mm. that I'm on dialysis, that I have a fistula? And, you know, and I pretty much just felt lost. Wow. And then he came along and we became friends. And I, I, <laughs> I would say, I would say that. He helped me in a way that nobody else could have. Wow. You know, he supported me in a way that nobody else could have. You know, and he saved me in a way that nobody else could have. You know? That's beautiful. So, mm -hmm. um, I felt and that. Now, now, and now the, the tables are turned and she's, uh, my rider died now, and she looks out for me. And everything I did when she was on that house, she's doing for me now. You because, know, so yeah, I understand. Yeah, you know, I understand exactly how he feels. People say, <laughs> ask me, well, well, you know, how do you do it? Because I know, I know how he feels. I know why he's tired. I know why, you know, yeah. when I come home, he's. I understand. I get it. And I always mm -hmm. say, I try to fill Marcus with my love. <laughs> You know, I try to bring him back, bring him up, you know, with, with my love, you know. Don't cry, Lisa. <laughs> <laughs> love is important. People is. don't know. And when a person loves you for yourself, it means a whole lot. And take you with the baggage, take you with the good, the bad, and the ugly. My husband used to say that, why should I leave you now when I didn't leave you before? Why should I not be with you? And I was the one that got sick first. He got sick later and I took care of him. But I love your love because you, you're like, you're right. You do understand and you do feel and see. And I hope somebody out there that maybe have a, a love like this or a relationship like this, whether it's a dialysis or any other illnesses, that they would give love a chance. They would give love a chance or at least try <laughs> or enjoy some of it, a piece of it or something. You know, because yeah. somebody, you somebody, you're, you're a twinkle in somebody's eye. You really yeah. are. You're a twinkle in somebody's eye. And God got the perfect match for you. Trust me, he does. Yeah. He already did it for me. I was glad for my 23 years with my husband. But I'm glad yeah. somebody is in love. I'm just in love with love. Ah! I ain't mm -hmm. mad at you. You done stirred the heart. Mm. Okay. You know, okay. no, that, that's what. <laughs> Somebody else needed to hear that and talk about it out there. If a patient wanted to start something like for kidney sakes, do you have any words for them? Um, find that one other person that you trust to start that organization with and mm -hmm. network. Just network, you know, make sure your heart is in it because it's, it's a lot of work. It's a lot of dedication. So make sure this is really what you want to do and that your heart is in it and start networking, get to know people, you know, um, LinkedIn is, 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 is a good, is a good app to use to get to know people that are interested in things that you're interested in, is interested yeah. in, you know, uh -huh. and um, network, 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 you know, reach out to different organizations. Like, uh, as far as kidney disease, you know, you have, um, uh, 
uh, Kidney Foundation and, you know, all right. these foundations that you can get information from, you know. Mm -hmm. So yep. you know, it's out there. All the information is out there. You just have to be willing to to research and look for it and ask yes. and use and use and use your ask. Use, use the people that you know will help you ask because that's what I learned. Being being uh, now CEO when Angela passed, me not expecting her to go. Yeah. And then not expecting to be CEO of anything was, was difficult, you know? So oh. what I had to learn was that to use the people that I trust and, and, and use them for their advice and for their help. You know, yes. and to reach out and yeah. to do research, you uh -huh. know, because it, 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 it's difficult, you know, you no, know, wow. but as, as time goes on, the more you do, the more you learn, you know, yeah. there's a learning experience, you know, it's an eye opener, but um, if your heart is in it, like my heart is in it, it can be done. It can I'm be sure. done. Wow. Wow. Hmm. Well, Mr. Marcus, you you did this at a young age and you deal for kidney sake, you deal with the youth. Uh, tell me a little bit about that. And, you know, what would you say to somebody young out there that might have to face dialysis? Or well, um, it's just it's this is just something that we're starting up now. We're not really speaking to the youth too much now. I did speak to a high school, Angeles high school. Back Excellent. last year, the kid, I spoke to the kids there, and I just mm -hmm. gave them a, a, a update on a, a, on our ESRD that it does it, the age doesn't matter when it comes to kidney failure. You can get it at That's any right. age, and you know a lot of these young kids they don't really follow any diet because they think they're young, they think they're invincible, they eat what right. they want to eat, right? Yeah, and, and um. And with all this junk food that they eat, easily diet get, they could get, contribute get diabetes. Easily they get hypertension. So yes. that's why I spoke to them about that. You know, to watch. You know, they don't have to have a, a strict diet, but do everything in moderation so the kidneys can function and everything can function well. Too much of something will will harm you. Too much of salt. Yeah. Too much of sugar. Diabetes. Too much salt. Hypertension. So that's what I was, yeah, you have to balance it out. So that's what I basically spoke to him about. And that's what I'm going to try to do when we start to get it up and running again, to start, you know, telling the wow. youth about that. Wow. And tell, them about my, and tell them about my story and what I went through so they can understand and see what it's all about. What the kidney, this kidney disease is very serious. It's very serious. That's and I'm very, I'm very surprised that kidney disease is not on the forefront, like, heart disease and cancer, they, their kidney disease is not out like that. And that's why these, the youth doesn't know too much about it. They know about all these other diseases, but they don't know about kidney disease. It's under a rock. I keep saying it's under a rock. Exactly. Get that rock, exactly. lady. So up. that's what I'm going to try to do is try to, you know, teach the youth about that. Amen. That's beautiful. I love that. I, I, I'm, a lot of in high I'm, school. On, I'm on the kidney transplant once again. So, God willing, I will receive my fourth kidney. Yes. Mm -hmm. That's good news to me. You up? Yeah. yeah. Wow. Yeah. Congratulations. That's what, Congrats. I'm going, that's what I'm reaching for. Yes. Well, keep us posted because we're going to want to know. How about that? I will. <laughs> we'll have you back again. <laughs> say. You know, so. Is there anything else you would like to say or anything else that I forgot to do or say? Um, um just look out for we for kidney sake, we just had a uh a, ver a mental health workshop via Zoom. Absolutely. So please look yes, for yes, yeah, so please look for up more upcoming workshops from us until we're able to get out there and see you guys and be able to interact face to face. But please look out for more workshops from us. Um, we want to thank everybody for their support. Um, we, we would love for you guys to support us even more. 
Um, um, also, um, like I said, we're having our praise party every fourth Sunday of the month. So come and then praise God with us. Who knows? You might have some other kind of parties coming, but we just want to see how this praise party works out first. So Lisa, I hope you're going to be there. Um, we're trying to have a virtual bingo event. Um, and, uh, we're trying to do our pink and pearls via Zoom. We're trying to put okay. a like a flip, like a little twist to it. So look out for that sometime in July. Mm-hmm. And um, you know, just right now we're having a really rough time between the COVID and between <sighs> the murders. Um, All right, really excuse me, time. I'm sorry. I can barely hear you because Steve called me three times. So I don't know if we either on the air, off the air, or if he telling me because he got another show or if he wanted to extend it. But I guess I'll end the show um, because okay. I don't know if this is good or bad. He's not sending me a text. He keep calling. I can't answer him because we were on the air. So uh, thank you, everybody. God bless. I'm glad you tuned in. I hope you learned something from it. Bless your life and be well, be good, be safe. Lisa Baxter, good night. Thank you. Hallelujah. Appreciate you extremely. This is the Lisa. That's the show, giving you the one, 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 and it can be one, my girl, and say, this is